This week on The Futurist, Tony Hunter. Food and drink are the only absolute non-discretionary things that human beings need. Everything else in your life is discretionary. Welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik, and I'm with my co-host, Brett King, zooming in from Asia. Hi, Brett. Hey, how you doing? Really great, thanks. It's like to have another show with you where we go around the world talking to most interesting people that are building out the vision of the future. And this week, we've got a great guest. Uh, Tony Hunter is a food futurist. So he's a futurist for the subject of food. And at first, I like food, so this is going to be a good show. Is food really changing that much? But then when you think about it, you go, wow, you know, it's like 25% of all human activity around the planet has something to do with making food, growing food, or distributing food. So it's a pretty big part of what we do in our lives. And yeah, of course, we need it every single day. Otherwise, we get quite hungry. Tony, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on The Futurists. Hey, Tony. Hey, Robert. Hey, Brett. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And to echo what you said, Robert, I mean, food and drink are the only absolute non-discretionary things that human beings need. Everything else in your life is discretionary. That's a big statement. I mean, we need clothing. It's very nice to have a roof over your head, but nice, but you know, like you can, you can buy a set of clothes and not change them for 10 years. Yeah. If you want to, you can, but you need food every single day. You don't need something new in your, um, in your clothing or anything else every single day. So I should probably qualify discretionary, non-discretionary every single day, food and drink. You don't, you're yeah. going to die sometime. Yeah, that's true. You're going to you're gonna run out of energy pretty quick if you don't do it. That's, that's true. You got to keep the tank filled. Well, what is happening in the world of food right now? Because frankly, I spend most of my time thinking about technologies uh, that involve computers, digital technologies, communications, telecommunications, so forth. And um, the food seems to be on the periphery, right? That's that's what we order up when we're busy working on our digital stuff. Is there a ton, ton of change happening right now? Is the technology innovation phase kind of coming into the te- into the food world? Yeah, absolutely, Robert. As you say, I mean, food used to be you know a poor second cousin backwater compared to things like the electronics industry, mm-hmm. but no more. I mean, the technologies we're seeing come into food at the moment rival anything we're seeing in the electronics industry. And so much so that my view is food is now technology. They are inseparable. Yeah, I think that's true. From farm to fork, you can't talk about food now without talking about technology. So you you can talk about farming as technology, of course. So food production, you know, we have a lot of technologies coming to that. But um, farming methods themselves are having to change. You know, we've lost 40% of our arable land the last 50 years due to soil erosion and pollution and a mismanagement of of land. You know, we obviously have uh, a huge debate going on about the Amazon and about deforestation and so forth there. So we need to apply technology in food production to get better at our ability to produce food without the impact on the planet. We've also had a lot of issues with supply chain in terms of food production the last few years after the pandemic. And, you know, with 2023 being a year potentially of of a global recession, you know, it's likely that those problems are going to continue. So we have to get better at supply chain management of food production, which some of that means we're going to have to be more locally resilient as well, I think. Is that your position, Tony? Yeah, look, I would agree there, Brett. I think COVID and the war in the Ukraine have shown the fragility or the certainly the weak points and the cracks in the global food system. In places like Australia, US and most of the world, we didn't go and find there was no food on the on the shelves. Maybe some foods are in short supply. You can't get the brand you want, but nobody went hungry if they weren't going hungry before. Try and find but, toilet paper in Melbourne, and no, uh, exactly right. I had the, I had a story of someone Sorry. trying to sell back two hundred rolls of toilet paper to Coles because he he realised he didn't need them, but they wouldn't take them back. So anyway, that's another <laughs> another story completely. But you know, it it showed that the current food system is actually not that resilient, particularly animal agriculture. I mean, in the US and elsewhere in the world. 
They pumped millions of litres of milk down the drains. They opened abattoirs to kill pigs and bury them because they couldn't kill them and pack them. Nobody wanted them. They were getting too big. So they killed them and buried them. Hmm. We had um, countries in Europe going, we're just going to stop exporting some crops for a while until we see what's going on. We've seen Indonesia ban palm oil exports for a while. Um, the Ukraine, as we know, wheat, sunflower, it's a massive issue and shows how fragile that system is. Why am I paying more for my bread in Australia from a war in, in, in Europe? doesn't make sense. Well, it's hard for people to connect the dots. That's true. And it's not often explained how intertwined these systems are. Here in, uh, it, you know, in countries like Australia and the United States, we have the advantage of um, redundancy in the food supply and different sources. Other parts of the world, though, are really suffering, I think, from the fallout of this uh, this Ukrainian invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, because they are dependent, heavily dependent on, on the wheat and other grains that are exported from the Ukraine. And those haven't been able to go out at the same volume that they did in the past. Uh, so the burden falls heavily on the global south. Uh, you know, one of the when we talk about supply chain, though, isn't it true that in in food distribution, one of the biggest issues is that food spoils food gets rotten mm. food sits on a loading dock or it's too long in the sun mm. um talk a little bit about where the waste happens in the food supply well most of the waste actually happens at the consumer end because mostly most manufacturers don't want waste they've bought the product they don't want to waste any more than they absolutely have to waste reductions a priority for them now if we look further back up the supply chain at things um, like fruit and vegetables there are enormous amounts of bananas in Australia that get ploughed under because either they don't have the right bend to them or they have some other image problem that they can't be sold. And do you know in supermarkets, people don't banana, buy dude. single bananas? They don't buy single bananas. For some reason, you go to your supermarket, look at the bananas, see the ones that are left. They're all singles. I go and buy every single banana I can find because no one else is going to buy them and there's no problem with them. So consumers are very, very fickle. And if we look at self-reported food wastage in the UK, for instance, under the COVID lockdowns, um, food wastage, self-reported food wastage has dropped dramatically. As soon as the lockdowns finished, food wastage went back up to 2018 levels. Oh, really? It did That's not stay down. Yep. So, you know, Whilst food, we think of food as expensive, it's not. As a percentage of our income, food in most places like Australia, Europe, UK, US, is pretty damn cheap. I pay a dollar fifty for an av avocado. Do I really care? Like it's a dollar US. Do I really care if I throw that away? No. If I was paying ten dollars for the avocado, I'd make damn sure that it didn't go to waste. So, so many things are so cheap that we really don't attach often the value we should to the food we've got and wastage is thought of in terms of just it's only a few bucks who cares so it's really people buy food and bring it home and then they buy too much and it spoils or they don't cook it quickly enough or something so it's not an issue that food's spoiling in the supply chain you think that that's been sorted out i don't think it's been sorted out i think that depending where you are in the world there are major problems like in places like like africa they harvest the crops small holders put it to the side of the road and wait for the truck to come by to take it to town. That's not good. So what they've done now, bringing again technology into the supply chain, they build solar-powered monoblock refrigeration cold rooms, hmm. self-contained, solar-powered, that people can put their produce in and chill it to stop the spoilage before the truck comes to take it to town. It That's also incredible. powers an internet hub and Wi-Fi hotspot. For people's telephones that's how it's happened where, where is this in uh, this kenya in africa i think it's either okay. kenya or nigeria so definitely the kenyan uh, farmers they use uh, smartphones for commodity yeah. trades and yeah. all sorts of stuff it's pretty sophisticated actually it is and i think yeah you know, we're just segueing a bit there into africa brett i mean that's one of the last frontiers of food production whereas we know that that is one of the this is the most food poor continent on the planet. And we have places like Nigeria that I think by 2050 will have more people than the continental US. Yeah. So not as rich, but there's a lot of people there. And what's happening at the moment is people are saying, what you need to do is what we've done, right? So 
set up a feed system, import lots of nitrogen, phosphorus. COP27 said, we want to make access to fertilizers easier. No, that's not the answer. Look at the problems that's caused. Dead spots in the ocean, runoffs, everything else that's going on. It's not the answer. So what I say is, in Africa in particular, and any country that's early on in developing their food system, why should they duplicate what we've done? And the best example, which is what clued me, Brett, was Kenya. Now, in 2002, Kenya needed to vastly improve their telecommunications, to do things like you said, Brett, get in their smartphones and trade and send money and everything else. Now, what did they do? Did they dig tens of thousands of miles, kilometres of trenches, put in copper wires, put in um, you know, handset manufacturing industry and the whole lot, and then say, don't worry, in 100 years' time, you guys will have mobile phones, but we've got to follow what was done in the West. Of course they didn't. They put cell towers in, they gave, made access to small, easy, cheap smartphones readily available, and that spawned a whole raft of industries. And Kenya leapfrogged a century of telecommunications, literally a century, I'm not making it up. You go back, you look 100 years, telephones, co copper wires to the wow. mobile phones in a decade. Yeah. And you so think something that, similar is going to happen in agriculture? And, that's and what think... I'd say should happen, Robert. I don't know that okay. it will happen because there are powerful interests that want to sell more and more nitrogen, want to feed industry, want to grow more cows and more chickens and more whatever. And these countries are being told that this is the way to go. You need to be like us because look how successful it's been for us without mm. looking at the downsides and everything else. And what that leads to is a lack of both food security and food sovereignty. The two things are quite different. Singapore probably thought it was very, very food secure until Malaysia stopped selling it chickens. And all of a sudden, no fresh chickens in Singapore from Malaysia anymore. So they had security maybe, which um, one of the, um, the definitions there from the United Nations is um, all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. That's all very well, but that can mean I can buy it from the country next door or I can ship it in from the US or Australia or wherever. But sovereignty at a, um, I feel like a political level, meaning the power of the state, is more about do I control my own food supply? If someone decides to shut off food to me, what is the impact to me? For people like countries like Singapore, it's enormous. They import mm -hmm. over 90% of their food. Middle East is in much the same, anything from 95% in Oman to 80 odd percent in places like Saudi Arabia. So they don't have sovereignty. They might have security because you can always go and get what you want. So you think you're secure. But, and that's where these new technologies can come in because they can be, like Brett was saying, cited in that country and make the food in that country. Why should so, they not put the new technologies in? So some of those technologies look really interesting to me. Some of them are advancing and, and are getting quite a bit of investment, such as the lab-grown proteins. So we're talking about lab-grown meats, lab-grown chicken, lab-grown seafood um, that are indistinguish, indistinguishable cellularly from you know naturally grown meats. And then the other one that's really interesting for me is the uh, vertical farming using hydroponics. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, these are, these are a couple of technologies, but give us, give us the gamut of, of technologies that you think we're, we're going to be seeing emerging over the next 10 years or so in this space. Yeah, well, I think, Brett, there are five technologies that for me are driving the future of food, and that's alternative proteins, cellular agriculture, genomics, the microbiome and synthetic biology. And those are being accelerated by three other technologies, which is AI, sensors, and quantum computing. And as I said, I believe food is now technology. Technologies advance exponentially. I say food is exponential. So that is what's going to happen. And alternative proteins includes our plant-based, um, cellular agriculture includes cultivated meat. Um, and if you have a look at synthetic biology, the most interesting one there for me is currently something called plant molecular farming. And what you do there is you take the gene for something you want, put it into a plant, grow the plant, extract the molecule you want and use it. And then you process the rest of the product. 
Now, Nobel Foods are growing casein in soybeans. They grow the soybeans, they take the casein out, make cheese from it, and process the rest. Their first crop's been harvested in 2022. There'll be Tress products in 2023. We have Polopo in Israel growing egg white proteins in potatoes and people growing pigments in lettuce. So are they growing these at the cutting edge. Are these being grown in a greenhouse, yeah. out in a field, or in a laboratory? Fields. So this is field oh. work. So they, they, the crop field crops. Okay. And if you look at some of the other ones, some some depending on the country, what the legislation is in the EU, you probably can't do any of that, but you can in the US. A company called Orf Genetics in Iceland grows them in huge greenhouses, grows barley, and they produce human growth factors in barley for cosmetics and have been for decades. Wow. Are they are they doing genetic manipulation of the DNA at the level of like, you know, a seed it's or they're transgenic yeah. species, right? They've yep. got yep. other well, they've got other um, components in the d- genome. Yeah. yeah, they've taken the gene out of an animal. I, I call it growing animals in plants. Or maybe but are they the doing it? Animal. How do they maybe do that? It's a small bit of the animal. Is it, is, it, is it, you know, seed by seed or cell by cell? It seems like it'd be hard to scale that up to a whole field of potatoes. Oh. No, basically, what you do is you genetically modify the um, crop and then all its seeds contain the DNA you want. That's one way of doing it. And then you can do that. And then if you want to 10 times the production, you plant 10 times the number of fields. You want oh, to so you have to grow one them. round and get the seeds and then, yep. um, okay. Uh, okay. And then onwards and upwards from, from there. And it's a lot more efficient than using things like huge stainless steel bioreactors, which are expensive to buy yeah. and have all sorts of problems, plant molecular farming. A couple of advantages are, Again, easily scalable, and there are no human pathogens in plants. So you don't yeah. have a human pathogen problem compared to looking at um, you know, contamination and so on when you're growing things in factories. Oh, so the plant molecular farming, the, the factory is the plant itself. Exactly. And you can grow it in a field like you would a conventional yep. plant. Yep. Okay. But I don't know if you guys know, but in, in the 3D bioprinting arena, particularly for medical uh, purposes, for organs like livers and hearts, where it requires fine vasculature, they're actually now producing that that sort of vascular structure using plant material. Because you know, like if you look at uh, um, various types of leaves, they can they can reproduce that and get the, the cellular scaffold that they can use for for those constructs. It's very interesting. But that's for a human organ. So, so back to the back to the growing or something. No, no, that's okay. It's like it's all it's all interesting. I mean, actually, what you're pointing out is that plants can be a kind of factory, right? Ooh. The plant can be this. It can produce a scaffold. You can use that to grow uh, human cells if you're trying to make an organ. But you can also use it to produce other kinds of things. You know, I'm, I'm astounded that you can produce human. Um, serums inside of a plant that could yep. be extracted. And I'm, all, yep. I'm curious about the process of extraction as well. Uh, it just seems like it would take a while to scale that up, but obviously they have really, uh, they've really managed to do that in the last few years. That's astounding. Last time I tuned into synthetic biology for plants, they were still using those big vats like you described. And that requires a huge upfront investment. And many of those companies got into trouble because they couldn't make the economics work. And it seemed like synthetic biology was an industry where the sun never quite rose entirely. Um, but according to what you've written on your blog uh, at, at futuresforfood.com, mm. you actually say that synthetic biology is coming into its own right now. It's it's maturing. Yeah, absolutely. There's a company called Perfect Day in the US. Um, they've raised, uh, it's uh, 750 million US dollars to scale up their production of whey protein from yeast. And they're backed by a company called ADM, one of the biggest ingredients companies in the world. They're a 62 billion US dollar company and they're helping Perfect Day to scale. And they're selling their whey protein now and they're scaling that. And at some point in the future, it looks likely that whey protein made by producing it from genetically modified yeast will be the same price or cheaper than whey protein as a byproduct of cheese making from animals. So that's that's done, done and dusted. And that's one of the things I look for as a futurist. Mm. When do some of these new technologies, these startups, If they get support and or investment from a huge conventional organization, to me, that says the future's here. 
And when ADM said, we're getting into bed, we're perfect day, we're going to help them because these big companies have everything startups don't have. Yeah. Sales, marketing, manufacturing experience, um, you know, they, they can do all the things that they, they um, the, the startups can't. So when I see that come together, I go, that is, that is now a, a given. Now, how far that'll go, as, as we know as futurists, no one can tell you the future. Anyone who does is either a fool or a liar. But you can say what the alternative futures could be. Cool. So, so anyway, we like to get acquainted with our futurists by asking them a series of quick questions. So the, okay. what we're going to do now is a quick fire round, and I'm going to let Brett administer the poison this time. So, um, Brett, go for it with the quick fire questions. Here we go. Welcome to the lightning round. What was the first science fiction story you remember being exposed to? Doctor Who in black and white. Doctor Who. I think mine was probably Star Trek. But um, And what technology do you think has most changed humanity so far? Ooh. So far, um, um, chemistry. In manufacturing, some of our products are made via chemistry, even things like your vanilla essence you get from petrochemicals made by that. But in the future, synthetic biology. The joke will not be, well, it's not rocket science, this science, is it? It'll be, well, it's not synthetic biology, is it, after all? Fair enough. <laughs> I saw a good sketch on that once where um, you, had, uh, you had a rocket scientist at a party and he, everyone's yeah. introducing themselves and he's like, well, you know, well, it's not exactly rocket science. And then in comes a brain surgeon yeah. and he introduced himself as a rocket scientist. And the guy says, well, it's not exactly brain surgery. I thought that was very clever, but anyway. And, and, my, um, and my, my one is to be a third guy come in and say, yeah, but it's not synthetic biology. There you go. <laughs> right, name, name a futurist or on, entrepreneur that has influenced you and why? Oh, um, I think the biggest influence to me has been probably in the early days, early exposure, Michio Kaku, mm. just as a general futurist. And more recently, as a big thinker, P Peter Diamandis. I've got some of the stuff he comes up with, and he has some phenomenal. Um, he has the X Prize. He's the start started the X Prize, and I uh, read a couple of his books. Um, what's it? Abundance and the future is faster than you think. Recommend oh, those yeah. to anyone if you want to see what's going on. Grab those books. Um, and if I look at um, quickly at uh, futurists and their um, uh, like theoretical futurists, Andy Hines out of the University of uh, Houston, and Joseph Voros, who's uh, from the University of Swinburne down in in Melbourne in, in Australia. In in respect to your specific field, Tony the future of food and so forth. Tell me, have you got any science fiction story you can call on that is representative of the future you think uh, of food production? Well, I mean, the one that jumps to mind, which is, of course, the little cliched is, of course, the Star Trek replicator. Everybody gets asked, when are we going to see a Star Trek replicator? But, you know, in some ways, we have a Star Trek replicator and we also have... Um, uh, well, so just go back to the Star Trek replicator. There's a company that's making a, a molecular uh, beverage maker, and they reckon they can duplicate any beverage that you want from soft drink to um, whiskey to wine using a blend of um, compounds that they've got right. in their machine and an alcohol reservoir and water reservoir, gas reservoir, and they can print you any drink you want on your bench top. That's about it. So we've gone a long way from the foodie, the three D foodie printers to to now something more. The molecular stuff is very interesting because that's essentially yeah. what a replicator is, right? Yep, yep. And uh, you know the old one with the teleportation. I mean, we have teleportation in some ways. If you look at it, we can take something. I can scan something here um, in my office. I can send it to you in Thailand and you in the US. And you guys can print an exact copy at that end. Is that teleportation or not? I sent the data and the data went <laughs> over there. And did I just teleport that or not? Mm. Rebuild it? Mm. 
Yeah, there's a there's a, some interesting debate that goes on about teleportation, yeah. but uh, you know, let's not get into that. It's for another show. Which, yeah, definitely. You you go first is my view on that. I'll wait for you to come out the other side. <laughs> yeah. No, you remember that Mel Brooks thing with the teleporter? And why did anyone? Why didn't anyone tell me my ass was this big? No, sorry. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, that's a good that's a good point to take a break on. So thanks, Tony. Um, you are listening to The Futurist. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back with more discussion on the future of food production and the future of agriculture and uh, food itself uh, right after this break. You're listening to The Futurist. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce and support The Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurists. I am your host, Brett King, with my co-host, uh, Rob Tursek. Uh, this week, we're speaking to Tony Hunter. He is a food futurist. We've been discussing the issues of food scarcity and food security and uh, uh, some of the emerging methodologies around this. Um, we do. Uh, we will be getting into a bit more of his uh, forecasting process uh, in a moment. But before that, let's just go to our deep dive. Robert, what have you ha have for us? this week in News from the Future. News from the Future and the Deep Dive. Here we go. Uh, this week, I'm going to talk to you about uh, in the environment and climate change, a topic we've covered many times on this show, but it's going to keep coming back. And that's because one of the core themes of this program is that there are certain forces that are going to constrain the future. They're going to set the course for the future. And clearly, one of those is natural resources and the environment. Um, and so, of course, there's been a huge amount of news about weather recently, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. So one way to summarize all that is to say simply that uh, the climate will shape the future, and that's perfectly obvious. But the flip side of that is also that not all climate change is natural. Human activity can affect the climate. We know this. Uh, Human-induced climate change will also affect the future. So anthropo anthropogenic climate change is linked to human activity, such as uh, the amount of fossil fuel that's burned or aerosol releases into the atmosphere, land alteration from agriculture, deforestation, and so forth. These are human activities that actually shape the climate, and therefore we reap the uh, atmospheric consequences. Right now, we're experiencing some of those consequences. We're experiencing side effects of anthropogenic climate change right now. You might call it global weirding, not global warming, because we're having these really, really unusual weather effects. I am in California right now where we have been inundated with rain Crazy. for weeks yeah. after seven years of drought. We can't complain because we've been begging for the rain. We just wish that seven years worth didn't come in a two-week span because it's wiping out bridges and knocking out roadways and washing away cliffs and causing mudslides and sinkholes that swallow cars and so forth. So that's definitely a weird phenomenon, and it doesn't seem to be stopping because there's another storm on its way right as I speak. Uh, so we have that happening here. But meanwhile, in Europe, where it should be cold, if you remember just a few months ago, everyone was speculating that the Europeans were going to have a cold winter and there, there was an issue with getting gas from Russia and how are they going to heat the factories and the homes. But Europe is having a heat wave right now, and so they're not getting a nice frosty winter at all. Um, also, news came out this week, a report was released that in 2022, ocean temperatures reached their hottest temperature ever recorded. We've been re we've been doing accurate recording of weather uh, of temperatures in the ocean since the 1940s, and we have accurate records going back now, consistent records going back to the late 1950s. Uh, hotter oceans have an effect. They lead to more extreme weather, including hurricanes, typhoons, and the cyclone condition that's causing the storm in California right now. And more moisture in the air are also something that drive further uh, rainfall, these atmospheric rivers that we're experiencing that also occurred last year in Australia and in Europe. 
Uh, so we see the sort of like, you know, weird side effect occurring in different places at different times. And we're more focused on what's happening with our weather right now in our place that we happen to be in. But as you can start to see, there's this strange pattern emerging and it's unlike any other weather pattern we've ever had. Warm oceans play a role in that. And why that's happening is the ocean's a giant sponge. 90% of the excess heat that's trapped by gas, greenhouse gas emissions is absorbed by the ocean. So as I said at the outset, natural resources is one factor that's gonna shape the future, but those resources are allocated by private markets and public policy. And those are two other forces that shape the future. So it's really about the interplay of market forces and policy that are gonna determine how climate change unfolds in the future. Now, people can actually do something about this trend. Politics really matter. Politics really count. This is how humans govern their behavior, particularly when we can't leave it to the free market. And the basic premise is pretty simple. Consume less today and pollute less today so that we can preserve a healthy climate for future generations. It sounds pretty simple, but it turns out it's a really big political challenge. It's a tough policy issue, yeah. Yeah, but we've risen to the occasion. We've actually managed to do this. Uh, so there, there was more news this week. A UN report was released that's a really good example of government policy that shows how the natural environment can be improved if humans make a change in their behavior. It's about the ozone layer. And you may recall that in 1985, scientists discovered this giant hole in the ozone layer that was above Antarctica, and it was growing. And it was actually quite a scary thought because the ozone layer absorbs the sun's um, ultraviolet radiation or a, a huge amount of it so that we don't you know, literally burn our skins off. Uh, but the worry was that we were dumping so many chemicals, hundreds of, of different kinds of chemicals called chloral, fluorocarbons, CFCs, and they float up into the atmosphere and they start to erode the ozone layer. Uh, so in the late 1980s, the world galvanized really quickly. They discovered this hole in 1985. By the, by the, mid, by the late 1980s, uh, there was some impetus around the world to actually do something about it. And by 1988, the Montreal Protocol was signed. Well, since that time, the, the amount of CFCs in the air has declined by 80%, and the ozone hole appears to be repairing itself. So this is a sign that humans actually can get their act together relatively quickly and do something uh, about human-induced anthropogenic climate change. And that brings me to two stories this week, two political stories. One of them comes from Brazil, uh, where a new president has just been inaugurated. He's returning to office after some time out of office and actually time in prison. It's Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva better known as Lula. And Lula has just taken office, uh, vowing to fight for fight against uh, forest deforestation in the Amazon. And he's also promised to renew, resume the monitoring of illegal activity in the rainforest. And he's gonna process, you know, prosecute uh, illegal logging and other activity that happens in the Amazon, which is great because his predecessor, Yair Bolsonaro, didn't do that. In fact, he weakened all the environmental agencies in Brazil right. and kind of encouraged, uh, some people say he promoted the illegal mining and logging in the, in the Amazon. Um, but many of Bolsonaro's decrees were can be undone by uh, by Lula, and Lula intends to do that. Now it's not going to be easy. He faces opposition. Uh, he's got a split uh, Congress, and in um, in the Congress there will be some uh, pro business uh, interests that are going to push legislation that'll stop him. They want to open the Amazon to further mining and further cattle farming, and also six of the nine governors of Amazonian states. They actually support economic development. They see developing the forest as a way to grow their local economies. So it's not an easy road ahead of him. And that's not all. Just as he was about to take office uh, this past weekend, there was an insurrection uh, where the uh, the capital was taken over by rioters, uh, similar to what happened in the United States just two years ago in Washington, D.C., uh, so the, these insurgents briefly occupied the Capitol, the presidential palace, the Supreme Court and the Congress. They defaced it. They made a huge, gross mess everywhere. They've been arrested. More than uh, more than 1,200 people have been arrested uh, and more arrests are coming. So you know, there's been some pushback. But just today, um, uh, Lula came out with the full government, the, the courts, all the ministers, and they united around this new presidency, which is something that the United States hasn't quite managed to do uh, because we have yeah. plenty of politicians here who still contend that the last election was flawed in some respect, though there's no proof to show that. And so the flip side of the Brazil story, uh, which though there was this insurrection, there seems to be a, a healthy response to it. In the United States, we have a different outcome here. Uh, and of course, in the last couple of weeks, we've witnessed this kind of embarrassing spectacle where there's been a fight for leadership in the House of Representatives in the Congress. Um, and who, the people who've now taken control of Congress, uh, sorry, of the lower House of Congress, the House of Representatives in the U.S., 
are actually the same set of politicians who denied the election was accurate, uh, the people who fought against it, and the people who supported uh, President Trump's attempt to uh, overturn the government and his insurrection. Those are now the people that are running the House. And so there's going to be quite a, uh, quite an outstanding and bizarre episode or spectacle in American history coming up. To win uh, elections as the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy had to cut a deal with the most extreme elements in the Republican Party in the United States. And he ceded much of his authority to them. And that means that they are in effectively in a position to veto or actually oust him from his role if they don't get their way. So a small number of very extreme politicians have an outsized voice in our lower house of Congress. Um, it's worth noting that many of these politicians take hundreds of thousands of dollars of political donations from fossil fuel companies. For instance, during the 2022 campaign, Speaker McCarthy himself took more than $500,000 of political donations from oil and gas interests. So in the United States, you can expect little to no progress on environmental policy and environmental issues and possibly even a defunding of those uh, of those initiatives uh, with the current Congress that we have. The summary on this simply is this. Uh, anthropogenic climate change is caused by humans and humans can actually do something about it. We have two examples of humans doing something positive about it. And unfortunately, one example of humans who are kind of resetting the clock and taking a step backward. We'll keep you posted on the story because climate is going to be a big factor in the future. But Tony, I wanted to bring that up uh, because I thought it's kind of useful to put food in the context of climate change. Obviously, the two interplay uh, considerably. I think Brett made the point earlier that a considerable amount of farmable land has been lost to, uh, mm -hmm. to either desertification or some other factor. Uh, it's quite clear then that our food supply is dependent on a healthy climate. Can you talk a little bit about that in the, in the light of resilience and the comments you made before the break? Yeah, and look, just to um, uh, agree with what you're saying there, Robert, the anthropogenic climate change is real. Um, I was just reading just recently, um, over the last 800,000 years, the CO2 content of the atmosphere has not gone above 300 parts per million prior to the Industrial Revolution. It now rests at, don't quote me, but something like 438, 448. And so people who go, oh, no, it's nothing, it's just natural. Well, they take in Antarctica, I think it was, they take the small gas bubbles from the ice and test the CO2 content. And that's how they plotted 800,000 years of CO2 in the atmosphere. Hasn't gone above 300 until we see the Industrial Revolution. I don't know what more we can say there on that. Yeah. But if we have a look at that, and at the moment, with climate change, what we're looking at is even if we do our very best, even if Congress were to experience some epiphany in the US and everybody, all the other conservative politicians did so, we're still heading probably for 1.5 degrees or more um, in the future. And that is going to um, dramatically affect in the long-term future of crops and mostly in areas that can afford it least. Yeah. So in places like India, China, sub-Saharan Africa, even Brazil, they're going to experience greater than 5% drops in crop yields for things like potatoes, rice, wheat, and corn. So basically, those people are going to suffer. And if we look through to the end of this century, we're looking at a 24% decrease in yield of corn in the U.S., so, wow. so food yeah. scarcity is going to be a major feature of climate change, which is going to accentuate the problem of eco-refugees or climate migration. There's a very strong argument that right now what's happening in the southern border of the United St States, the, you know, Guatemalan, Ecuadorian, um, you know, people coming up from, from the south, already this is largely an impact of climate change because mm -hmm. They have, they, they can't, because of the warming temperatures there, they can't farm, their crop yields have already failed. Um, you know, you've got, or, or food scarcity is already emerging there. So this is a massive issue. Um, so Tony, as a food futurist, you know, if you were designing a solution to this problem, what, what would it be? The thing solution, Brett, is basically what we talked about previously the new technology. So rather than supporting population growth and growth of the middle classes through conventional agriculture and just trying to do more of what we do now, and by the way, there's not enough arable land or fresh water on the planet to do that. Just think about that. Not enough arable land or, or fresh water on the planet. 
to simply duplicate what we do now, feed an extra 2 billion people and the growing middle classes. We need to do more with less. And most of these technologies we're talking about can either do it with much reduced water, because water scarcity is going to be the next big one, despite all the floods that Robert's having. Um, and it's going to be a major issue globally. So arable lands, you talked about, Brett, reduction in the, the, um, uh, the amount of arable land and its, and its productivity. So some of these technologies will use 99% less land, 90% less water to produce the same amount of food as an agricultural crop. So using these technologies and doing more with less is a way to address the fact that we can't simply keep sucking resources out of the earth, dumping our waste wherever we can and expecting it's all going to be okay. Now, Tony, one of the things, one of the solutions for this that's been proposed many times over the last 10 or 12 years is uh, vertical farming. And the idea there is to put the farm in the city where the people are and use, you know, a, maybe a disused warehouse or an outdated uh, factory of some sort that's not being used and grow, grow the food uh, under lights with uh, in a closed system. So you don't need to have pesticides because it's all indoors. There's no bugs and you can recycle the water. So it's also very water efficient. Um, but as far as I know, they've never really cracked the formula to scale these. They've tried this in many places in Chicago, here in Los Angeles, in downtown Los Angeles, I know of two places, um, but the economics never seem to work out. What's your take on vertical farming? Is that a solution? Is that something in the future? Or is it one of those technologies where the sun never quite rises? Well, the sun doesn't need to rise, which is one of the advantages for it, Robert. So it's all <laughs> yeah, if you have, you have plenty of electricity, that's a point. That's right. But I mean, it is quite successful in parts of the Middle East, where obviously oh, really? prices are that's all imported. So in the Middle East, there's been a big expansion of vertical farming. The biggest problem we're seeing at the moment is the huge rise in energy costs, because that's the primary input cost. And whilst we are getting a large amount of our energy from fossil fuels, um, coal and gas, and the cost of those is going up. And it, where that contributes to the increased cost in vertical farming is making a lot of them marginally or even uncompetitive, or some people are putting off capital expenditure because at the moment, with the rise in energy prices, it just doesn't make sense. Now, if we move to a fully renewable energy grid and where some of these um, products can use, use their own solar energy, then that's a whole different ball game. And there is a company not doing vertical farming. Well, so to go back to your question, I think there's a future for vertical farming. I think it's in a down tip at the moment until we look at uh, energy prices. I think it has a place in the food system. Will it ever replace huge amounts of agricultural land? That's an, an iffy one for me. But there's a company called Solar Foods in Finland. They suck moisture out the air um, into their machine, separate out the moisture, the carbon dioxide and the nitrogen, and using solar energy, they split the water into hydrogen and oxygen, they add a few minerals, and they grow single cell protein. And they so can this use is this protein. Sol to make NASA's food. talked about using this solar food on long duration space missions yep. as well, hasn't That's it? That's where it came from. So Air Protein or a US company, they're doing the same thing, but solar foods are building their first factory. Um, and their Solane product will be on the market soon. So we'll see whether it truly is commercially viable, but they're building a factory to do it. Did you it, say it, air, this, air protein? Is that the yeah, word? No, this is called, they call it solar food, but basically it's producing protein out of air because, you know, with a chemical treatment or electromagnetic treatment of the noble gases that are in the atmosphere and stuff like that, it's pretty interesting. That's but it a produces snack. a consumable food. But, yep. it, you know, is, is it nutritionally of, of real value, Tony? Yep. It's got a fantastic amino acid profile. It's got very low fat content. And, you know, it is an ideal product um, for then texturizing, same as you would do with a soybean where you grind it up and texturize it to make it into plant-based products. You can texturize this in the same way to make it into alternative protein products. And that Solar Foods and the other company is called Air Protein. And so yeah. they, they they're trying to commercialize this old NASA. Technology. It almost sounds like the manna that was uh, <laughs> um, in the uh, the Old Testament, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Hey, I know, guys, we've only got about five minutes left, so let's get a little bit sci-fi. This is a great way to take us into this. But, you know, yeah. looking out 50 years in the future, Tony, what what is our food production, you know, at, at 9 billion, you know, uh, or, or 10 billion inhabitants on the planet? What does it look like? Well, let's let's go to my preferred future because, as I say, anyone thinks they can tell you the future is a fool or a liar. But what I see is us using these new technologies to manufacture large portions of our food requirements without the anthropogenic effects and impacts that we're currently seeing, so that we don't, in places like Africa in particular, simply duplicate the way we do things now. So we're using these new technologies. There's far more food sovereignty around the place, countries being self-sufficient. We're not exporting products all around the planet, chewing up resources again as well and swapping them around, and people are basically assured of getting nutritious food that they need. You had written that SynBio will eat the world. So tell us about that vision. Like, How will synthetic biology eat the world? The other part of that is SynBio will eat the world, and the world will eat SynBio because synthetic biology is used to make products that we eat. Cheese, you like cheese? You guys love cheese, right? Let me tell you how, you how you make cheese. Well, you used to make it with the fourth stomach of a two-day-old dead calf in some milk, separate out the curds and the whey, get the curds and make it into cheese. Very simple one. Now, people realized in the 80s that, oh, there's not going to be enough dead calves around because cheese consumption is going up like this. And people don't like the idea of all two-day-old dead calves being killed for their stomachs. And where are we going to sell the veal? It's not that popular anyway. So our friends at Pfizer inserted the gene for chymosin, which is one of the enzymes in a calf's stomach, into a microorganism. And since 1990, that chymosin has been used to make cheese. And it's now used to make 85 to 90 percent of all cheeses in places like the US, Australia, Europe, etc. So if you like cheese and you've been eating cheese for the last 32 years, if you've been around long enough, you've been eating a food made with the product of a genetically modified organism. And now no. I ask, are either of you guys going to stop eating cheese? Because I've told you that. No, so, but, it, but it's, it's just, well, you know, I it's think we have biology. to change our, I think we have to change our core thinking on this. So it's just a collection of molecules, as you've said. And if we can get that molecule mix right, and that's, I think, where, you know, I think the challenge to this will be meat, right? If we can convince people that lab grown proteins are just meat, that they're just constructed in a, a you know, a, a different way from the way we've grown them before, but they're indistinguishable from a chemical or, or, or biological uh, state, you know, from, from naturally grown meat. I think there will people that will still pay a premium for naturally grown yeah, beef, sure. for example. But The way but they do for organic food, you right. know. Right, but that's going to be um, that's going to be a price point issue for those people and a sign of their wealth and so forth. Yeah. The real challenge is that um, the the you know we already have these big commercial farming organisations that tend to um, you know and and Monsanto and well they've changed their name now, but you know the, these sort of companies that have um, you know reduced the nutritional value of food over time because of uh, this uh, geo or this engineering, you know, um, approach to things. And, and I'm concerned about sort of this Franken food f future where we get sort of synthetic foods that don't have the same value as naturally, um, you know, occurring foods. What's your position on that, Tony? People call it Franken food. Uh, Robert knows, I don't know if you've had it, but um, a thing called a turducken, a turkey, Stuffed with a duck, stuffed with a chicken. Yeah. If you want to talk about Franken food, there <laughs> it is, right there on your <laughs> kitchen table at Thanksgiving, right? Turducken? What on who on earth? I don't. I don't want to eat anything with the abomination. word abomination, <laughs> but it tastes <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's all about, Robert. In the end, like you're saying too, Brett, if we can get these products, whether they're plant based or air protein based or whatever, to actually taste good at the right price point, then people will buy it. At the moment, people say it doesn't taste as good as a hamburger, and people have this like a hamburger or a steak 
is the best tasting food that will ever be invented. I say, no, <laughs> it's simply the best tasting food we know at the moment. There is nothing to say we cannot develop a food product of some sort that will taste better than a hamburger. And have higher nutritional value, potentially. potentially exactly well. right. It's this, a is my issue. Yeah. this is my issue with plant-based meat. I, I have been unimpressed with plant-based meat. I've tried it. I gave it like the earnest college try. And I found I didn't like the texture of the taste, but also it's processed like crazy. And if you're not supposed to eat processed yeah. food, it's yeah, packed full of oil. Uh, uh, so do, do you eat bacon or ham? Sure. Have, yeah. have you had a look at the processing and the ingredients yeah. list on bacon and ham? Sure. It's longer than all the plant-based sorry, not all, the most of the plant-based products, bacon or ham, because people always want to compare it to a hamburger. Why? It's, well, I don't eat a hamburger made of bacon, though, right? Like no, it's, no, it's no. A, if you eat bacon, if, if, if you say to yourself, I'm going to evaluate this plant-based product against a hamburger only because I'm going to substitute one with the other, well, mm -hmm. no, what if you're substituting that for bacon or ham, for a, a heavily processed meat product? There are a huge number of heavily processed meat products with nitrates in them, right. with all sorts of issues um, in those products, but everybody wants to go, ah, we compare it okay. to 100 so the product. fair comparison is a plant-based sausage, uh, which probably is less lethal than a. Than I, a I actually like sausage. the Impossible Burgers, man. I, I mean, maybe <laughs> I'm, I'm weird, but I, I like. I them, think but... that's the state hey, of the art. At, at the okay, moment, Tony, it's the Impossible Burger. I agree with that. I, I want to leave you with one question before we wrap up, and and um, you know, but um, looking out 30, 50 years. Um, do you think synthetic biology is the biggest uh, technology that? Um, humanity will create over that time? Or do you think there's something bigger that you're optimistic about? No, Just I, I being a pure futurist now. Pure futurist, synthetic biology has the ability to change everything from how we make our screens for our mobile phones to the food that we eat. And it will have an enormous impact way beyond anything we have ever seen before, even in, including chemistry and all the things that chemistry has brought us um synthetic biology is literally going to change the world and that's my comment uh you know synthetic awesome. symbio will eat the world the world will eat symbio we're eating cheese we're already eating symbio we're with yeah. you on that we love synthetic biology on this show one of our earliest interviews was with andrew hessel who is a Thanks. huge proponent of synthetic biology you know, the nature has this incredible generative capacity in biology, and we haven't yet mastered it. Um, we think we have. We keep thinking we we found new ways to master it. But really what you're talking about, when you reprogram that, that power at the cellular level, you can unlock it and direct it to whatever, re, whatever purpose you need. And it's not just food. Um, because bear in mind, all of our healthcare, our pharmaceuticals, those also are derived from nature. Almost all of our energy is derived from some sort of biological yeah. product, even if it's, you know, fossil fuels from the ancient past. So we depend massively on biology for more than half the economy. I'm and with you on that. Synthetic bio is the future. Tony, it's been such a great pleasure chatting with you. We've enjoyed this tremendously. What a great topic. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we wish you very much the best in the future of food. Yeah. How do people uh, reach you? What's the best way for people to follow oh, you? I've got my website, which is uh, futuristforfood.com. Futuristforfood.com. Yep. And you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm quite active on LinkedIn. Please do connect with me there. And my e email address is um, tony at futuristforfood.com. Cool. And, uh, and Tony H like to underscore futurist on Twitter, right? Yep. That's right. And great. thanks, guys, for having me on the program. I'd like to say, have a great future. <laughs> thanks. Uh, that's, we'll that's, that's close to our tagline, which you're going to hear in a moment. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, great. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being on. I mean, yeah. uh, we've enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay, uh, that wraps it up for the week. Uh, you've been listening to The Futurists. Our guest this week was Tony Hunter, the food futurist. And um, for myself and for my co-host, Brett King, we want to thank everybody who's listening. We thank you, especially those who have been following us on social media and sending in suggestions for speakers and questions and so forth. We love that level of engagement. It's always fun to hear from the audience. And we really, we really are grateful to those who take a moment to give a five-star review for the show. That helps other people discover the show. And the good news there is that in the last six months, the program has been growing rapidly in terms of the number of downloads. So that's very encouraging feedback. Uh, 
keep helping us make the show findable for other people. We really appreciate it. Want to give a big shout out to Elizabeth Severance, um, our producer, who, and the rest of the team at Provoke Media, who so generously have supported this show. And um, well, I guess now it's time for us to do our slogan. Let's see if we can get this right, Brad. We'll see you in the, in the future. future. Well, that's it for The Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review. That really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.